Well, hello and welcome to the Heal with Helen podcast. This is the first in a series of episodes called Deconstructing ADHD. I'm recording this episode in October 2023, which is also ADHD Awareness Month. And at the time of recording, there is also a shortage of medication in the UK and in North America and probably other places as well. So the purpose of this is to share with you a bit about my journey, pre and post diagnosis. I'm going to be sharing what I've learned along along the way from my own lived experience, plus extensive reading and studying that I've done from a whole wide range of books about ADHD, trauma experts, doctors, spiritual teachers, and sometimes, you know, there's a crossover between those. Now, what I'm sharing is not intended to be a substitute for medical advice. I have to give that disclaimer, Uh, but I do invite you to do your own inquiry, your own research, and not just to take the narrative that you, you've been given uh, or by, by society. At, at the moment, there is a waiting list for diagnosis, which is growing daily. I think it, in some places it can be as, as long as seven years. Now, if you're one of those people, do you really want to be waiting that long to be diagnosed? Or do you want to start your, your healing journey? Right, so let's go back. Well, I'm not, I won't go back back to the beginning, but when I had a, a bit of a, a light bulb moment, shall we say, in June 2021, it was a month before my 58th birthday, and I was feeling quite low. I was in some financial difficulty, and I just felt that I, well, I was feeling like a failure, let's be honest. Because I, you know, I've been, I was comparing myself to others, thinking, well, why is it that some people, they do something and they seem to have success, and I always struggle. And then I saw a post, I think it was on Facebook, and it was a link to Gabor Mate's book, Scattered Minds, and something about ADHD. So I've always been one to, like, follow the breadcrumbs, trust my intuition uh, because I know from past experience if I don't listen to my intuition and act on it generally things don't work out (laughs) the way they're supposed to and they don't work out things don't end well shall we say so I read that book over the course of a weekend and it was all about his own diagnosis of ADHD and his experience and about how he had a trauma as a child and everything in that about how it affects people made sense and I thought right okay on the, and it was the weekend so I'm feeling impatient I need to call my doctor because I had to wait till the Monday morning to call them about getting a diagnosis now this wasn't the first time I'd been in touch with my my doctors about my mental health the first time was back in 2008 I was prescribed some antidepressants I took them for about a week and that is the only time that I've ever taken any kind of psychiatric medication um well prescribed stuff I have taken supplements like herbal things but um a friend of mine advised me she said well you what might happen if you take these you you can end up becoming dependent on them because that's what happened to her and I didn't want that I prefer to find natural ways through my depression and I've successfully done that over the years and then again at the beginning of 2020 I was going through a difficult time uh, partly because some things to do do with my eldest son who has drug and alcohol problems I hadn't seen him at that point for 
over four years and he had and hadn't spoken to him in that time either and he he got back in touch and so that brought up things for me understandably and I was watching a program it wasn't a documentary it was actually a drama about and the main character was a lady with bipolar disorder and that and it showed how well she was she was trying to she was starting out in a relationship but then there were days when she couldn't get out of bed and then there were other days when she got loads done and I thought and I I kind of felt that I identified with that and, and again I was feeling low so I got in touch with the doctors and this is the first time I'd been in touch with doctors since well 2008 so this is 2008 2020 so in 12 years and I was a bit anxious because now people were more open about mental health and talking about it but it's still a bit of a lottery whether you're going to get taken seriously and I thought well they might make me a, an appointment you know in a couple of weeks because you know what it's like in most places trying to get a doctor's appointment and they actually said you can come in this afternoon and I was really surprised um, that they took it so seriously and I was pleased as well and on you know and ever since then ongoing I have nothing but praise for my doctors some other aspects of the services not so good but my my surgery absolutely fantastic can't fault them um because I know they're in, under a lot of pressure as well and so I had an appointment and I had spoke to a mental health worker had a lovely chat and re they recommended a couple of things going to get some support for um well I was al already getting support with my son I've been going to care support meetings since 2010 when that was when I first realized that he, he was on on heroin I knew he was drinking a lot and doing all those things but at that point that was like ah oh, now I, I realized I needed help and also um there was still unresolved issues around my marriage uh, which I left in 2001 ended in 2001 but then it did take him a year to move out it, it was abusive it took me a lot of courage to get out of that and he continued to uh, make my life difficult until he died in 2014 so when he died that brought up a lot of stuff because when I got divorced when the marriage ended I thought oh great that's it I'm out of this and life will be rosy three young children to look after just started a full-time teaching job didn't you know my self-care was at the bottom of the list really and at the end of my first year of teaching in 2003 I was also diagnosed with celiac disease and that's another thing that I've come across um, a lot of people who've been diagnosed with ADHD also have autoimmune conditions and I'm going to talk more about that as I go as I go through this the links between all these things because nothing happens in isolation everything is related nothing is coincidence so at the, around that time as well because this was I think this was in about February 2020 so just before you know that big event and everything goes down and I was also listening to a summit on EFT emotional freedom technique or tapping and that was amazing it really helped me and I would just I cried and cried and cried let all the stuff come out and also through the um, mental health worker she suggested going to a local women's centre to some meetings for women who'd been or were still in abusive relationships. Now I'd done something similar back in 2016 because I realised, you know, after my ex-husband had died and brought up a lot of stuff and I, I had to take some time off work that maybe I should get some support around this. And looking back, you know, it was absolutely disgusting that nothing was offered at the time. 
because I went to my doctors once after um, to seek some advice. What should I do? Should I go to the police? And all he said was, well, it's up to you. Similarly with my solicitor and also perhaps even more surprisingly relate because when I said I wanted to divorce, he said, let's go and get some counseling. And I said, no, I just want to end this now. It's, you've had plenty of chances, you know, it's like, but I thought, well, if it makes the separation easier, I'll go. And the counselor that we saw also recommended that we had sessions, individual sessions as well. So during that individual session with her, I told her about some of the abuse and there was no recommendation, you know, that I get in touch with women's aid or something. I found out years later, I could have had free legal advice. I never got a proper divorce settlement. And he went because we obviously, you know, we want to try and make things as amicable as possible. And my solicitor said, oh, you know, don't go to court, but actually, you know, with hindsight, that's what I would have done, got a court agreement because he never paid, well, he did pay maintenance, but not regularly, he was self-employed, but then when he got a job, I did go to the CSA. Anyway, I'm rambling a bit, but it's giving you some background of some of the things I've been through in my life, which have obviously impacted on my mental health. So that, I went along to this, I think it's called the Freedom Program in 2016 for a few weeks. And I, and I just felt that I was bringing up all this stuff that it wasn't, but it wasn't relevant because everybody else was either still in their abusive relationship or had only recently left it. And I was, you know, over 14 years out of this relationship and I didn't want to still be going, hashing over the same things that had happened years ago and I knew this wasn't really going to help me with my healing and then it was similar when I, I spoke to the mental health worker she recommended going to a local women's women's centre because I moved and this was in a different area and and it was similar again most people well everybody else was it was recent or current and I just felt like I didn't fit in. I first day I walked in, I was feeling quite low. Nobody spoke to me or said hi. You know, you're new. Let welcome. And uh, but then we um, we went into lockdown, and so the meeting stopped anyway. Uh, but I did get some counselling, and I the counsellor was was very sweet. I mean, it was all done online, but she was she wasn't very well organised, and uh, it wasn't it wasn't very good. Um, you know, the counselling can only be as good as a counsellor and their experience and how much they've worked through their stuff. And I just felt like, she, um, again, as before, it's like this talking stuff, it's not really helping me. I'm just going over, over stuff. And I will come to this later, why then I came to understand why this was, wasn't helping me. So I did the, did the six sessions and uh, as we got, you know, on the NHS. And then we come back to 2021 when I had this realisation, contacted the doctors and because of my previous experience, I knew that I would be taken seriously. They put me forward for um, a diagnosis and I'd spoken to a couple of other people who'd also recommended putting, doing the right to choose with Psychiatry UK because you might get the diagnosis more quickly if you go privately rather than with the NHS. So, so I did that, I went online, filled in the application and then they, I got something through the post shortly afterwards about an appointment with my local mental health centre and at the same time, I got something back from Psychiatry UK, which slightly confused me because I wasn't expecting to get anything back so quickly. So I thought it might have been linked. Well, it turned out it wasn't. And <laughs> the NHS in this case were actually quicker than, than Psychiatry UK. So fortunately, because I, I have seen the forms that they'd sent to fill in 
And I'm like, what? The, some of the questions they were asking, bearing in mind, I've just turned 58 years old. And they're asking me questions about school and things like that. And I'm thinking, yeah, I don't know. It's such a long time ago. <laughs> what, what about what's happening now? Surely that's more important. Anyway, um, so I had my first appointment at the local mental health centre, I think in the October or November 2021, and then various, then the original psychiatrist I saw left, and then I saw a different one, and the first one I saw, you know, we talked a bit about how, you know, I was being affected, and the, my challenges, and um, again, she was asking me about my childhood, so, and I said, oh, one of the thing, things I like doing, you know, this thing about, you know, when you're interested in something, you hyper-focus. That was one of the things I'd seen. And um, so, well, you can't have ADHD because you like reading. And I said, well, I don't think that's necessarily true because after I'd read that first book on that Gabo Marte book, I think I read, I read two other books about ADHD in that week. One of them was um, Better Late Than Never, which was written by a British lady who was diagnosed. I think she was about 51 and she'd been a journalist and then became a teacher. And I think, I don't know why anybody would be a teacher <laughs> anyway, but I think, yeah, um, probably the worst, worst job. But anyway, everyone's different. And another book I read, it was it was a very positive book. I can't remember what it was called, but it was about, it was focusing on strengths. And it was an interesting comment in that book as well, that um, the lady who'd written it was a, it was an American lady who was a psychologist, psychotherapist type person. I said one of her clients had actually felt when they took the medication for ADHD, that it, kind of muted and suppressed their creative side so um so anyway yeah I had these appointments and then that first psychiatrist I saw left then I saw another one and they said well you you need to take somebody along with you who's known you a long time well fortunately well both both my parents are still alive but I decided I didn't want to take them because they're elderly and it's not I didn't really feel it didn't really feel right to put them through that because they don't they don't live locally to me so I asked an, an old school friend who I've known since I was four we still see each other regularly so that seemed you know we've known each other pretty much all our lives so she came along and she's a nurse as well and so she came along and supported me with the um with the appointments and again, there were lots of questions about what it was like at school and things like that, um, which seemed, yeah, as I said before, it seemed a bit irrelevant. But anyway, they have these standard questions that they ask and they just basically go down the list. It's a bit like, felt like a bit like a tick box exercise. And then you go away and wait to hear their verdict. And the verdict was combined type. ADHD and then I had to have another appointment I think I had two more after that um and he, he he talked about um medication and I have since found out that NICE that's the Na National Institute for Clinical Excellence they recommend as a first response to an ADHD diagnosis uh medication right okay I'm not going to make any comments about that because I'm going to come back to that later um, about you know what what happens once you're diagnosed and then um, so he said well there was there was a website I could go on of courses and I looked on this website and there weren't any and he said or oh, you can get in touch get in touch with again back with, with my GP services for um To, for a referral for to the local mental health services and to do things like CBT and he also and, and of course there was the, the medic, medication option and he 
gave me some information to go away and think about it. This information had all the side effects and things like that. And he said he was concerned about side effects. But in particular, one of the side effects is that it can raise your blood pressure. I'm thinking, well, well, that's not good. And he said to me, well, you've managed all this time, 58 years without it. So maybe you 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 won't need it any and it was his recommendation that I probably didn't need it but unfortunately he didn't put that on the letter and that caused more problems down the line with the DWP because since I'd contacted my doctors in June July whenever it was 2021 um Oh, no, it wasn't then. It was a couple of months later. A friend of mine said to me, because she works for um, an, a local sort of social housing organisation, and she, she's f- very familiar with the benefit system and things like that. Because nobody tells you this. And she said, well, you can, because I'm registered self-employed, she said, you can get signed off sick. So you, while you're signed off, you can get universal credit. So then I had to, get the get sick note get get signed off and I then had to go for an appointment at the job center which was absolutely awful this was I was at this point I was not in a good space and I was um so I went along anyway I said I really don't feel like I want to be going and um I, I'd also seen somebody again back at this women's charity who was supporting me with my with a PIP application as well because I said, "Oh, you can apply for PIP if you you know if you're if you if you're struggling with your mental health. It's not just for physical things." And she said, "Well, you better. It's better if you go to this and don't." But anyway, I was in tears. I was just not in a good place, and the woman there just kept pressuring me. I said, look, I can't work at the moment. I'm signed off. Here's a, you know, my doctor signed me off. They agree that I can't work. And she pressured me in, in the end saying that, oh, I could work three hours a week or something. But anyway, um, and when I got home, I put a whole note on my journal saying, no, this is not right. Um, I, was, I was actually in tears in the job centre it was, I felt awful. I hate, you know, losing my composure like that. And, um, and I think when you're, I mean, again, this is something else I'll come back to later when, when you're intelligent and articulate, then you're less likely to be believed (laughs) Um, because you can express what's going on, what's happening. I say, I need some space. I just need time, you know, to get, get my head together and get this diagnosis and see, and get the support that I need. So, so I had all this going on at the same time, all this DWP stuff at the same time as the um, as the diagnosis. So it was a lot. <laughs> it was a lot. And I tell you what, if you didn't have mental health problems before dealing with a DWP, you would certainly have them afterwards. Well, I'm going to end this episode now. And so in the next episode, I will talk about the what happened immediately after my, my diagnosis. The next things, you know, in terms of what, what happened, um, which might be helpful for you if you... Um, if you're going through the process or if you're thinking about it about your your options and that's the thing I mean I feel very grateful that because of my life experience um, there's a lot of talk about late diagnosis and then you know people saying oh I was diagnosed late and I was 26 no you're not that's not a late diagnosis (laughs) you're you're you you've there's more awareness now around mental health and trauma so you you're lucky at it to be diagnosed so young 
and you know and I'm not going to say that to worry about that now because you can't change the past so it's like but I'm grateful because I got a lot of experience a lot of knowledge a lot of wisdom and a lot of stuff that I'd read prior to my diagnosis and also was part of the thing beef myself up well I'm a meditation teacher I'm a coach I should be able to do this and one of my biggest lessons I think over that year was learning it was okay to reach out for help and that didn't make me a failure so thank you for listening and I will see you or see you (laughs) I'm a visual person I always say that because you can't see me I can't see you but I will be back for the next episode next week um, in uh, deconstructing ADHD and I hope you find this helpful love to hear comments your experience as well so until next time take care go well and lots of love